Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience. My name is Emily Whitehouse, and I serve as Associate Director of Admissions for the Master's Degree Program in Asset Management at the Yale School of Management. And today, I'm joined by our Faculty Director and Professor of Finance, Toby Moskowitz. Professor Moskowitz is also Principal at AQR Capital. Good morning, Toby. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Emily, thanks everyone for being here this, this morning or evening or wherever you are. And I'm also joined by our program director, Arwen Zeisler. Good morning, Arwen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Emily. And thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us uh, for the next hour to learn a little bit more about the asset management program. We're glad to have you here. Yeah, and so I'll echo that as well. We'd like to Thank you for joining us today to learn more about this exciting new program. We welcomed our first cohort just last month. And so we have about uh, 45 minutes together during which we will provide a program overview for you and discuss what makes the program distinctive, provide some insights on what we're looking for in candidates for the program, explore career outcomes, and provide some insight into the application process. We will then open to take your questions live for the Q&A session portion of this event. Before I pass the reins over to Professor Moskowitz to walk you through the program information, I'd like to offer a brief introduction to the Yale School of Management. At the business school, we're very much driven by our mission, which is to educate leaders for business and society. And it's at the core of everything that we do across all programs. Our community cares both about being successful in their careers and having a positive impact on society. And we believe that the mission has never been more relevant. Also of importance to our community is the School of Management's close connection with the greater university, Yale University. When you join the Yale SOM community, you're also joining the Yale University community. And this is a connection that we feel students should leverage. Our programs create strategic opportunities for engagement across campus, giving you access to the sharpest minds in academia, as well as to the resources of a world-renowned institution. All of our degree programs allow you to take electives outside of the Yale School of Management, as well as to give you access to Yale conferences, startup accelerators, cultural events, guest speakers, and more. The Yale School of Management attracts business leaders at various points in their careers with numerous areas of expertise from around the world. All of, the, all of these business leaders will become part of your Yale network. And by coming to Yale, you join a community of students, faculty, and business professionals who care deeply about the major challenges facing business and society, a fact reflected in the programs we offer. So you'll have access to a lot of different types of programs here um, and a lot of students that are participating in such programs. And so the asset management program um, really did fill the need and is one field of remarkable strength at Yale SOM. So in addition, we have doctoral programs in, in um, financial economics. And it's worth no noting that some of our asset management professors also teach in the PhD program. And certain required courses in the asset management program are joint courses with the finance PhD students. And Yale SOM offers a full-time two-year MBA with 10 different joint degree options, one of which is asset management. And all asset management students have the opportunity to take certain MBA elective courses and students in the MBA program leverage five years of work experience and tend to have, um, have the ability to advance their careers. They are often pivoting to a new industry or a function in pursuit of that MBA. However, about 5% of our MBA students are also silver scholars, which are high potential candidates who come directly from undergrad to the MBA without full-time work experience. And for silver scholars, the MBA experience and the joint degree experience is three years. They will complete two years of study with a year long internship in between. And we also offer the MBA for executives that welcomes professionals from three specific industries, asset management being one, along with healthcare and sustainability. And during your time at Yale SOM, you'll be able to network with 
asset management professionals in the executive MBA who average 13 years of experience and are preparing for leadership, um, senior leadership roles in top financial firms. And in addition to the master's in asset management, um, we also offer two other specialty master's programs in systemic risk and global business and society, um, the GBS program. And the school also offers a master of advanced management for candidates who have already earned an MBA from a global network school and want to come to Yale for a year of additional management study. And joining these is the newest program, a master's in public education management. Now I'll go ahead and pass the mic to Professor Moskowitz and ask that he introduce himself and introduce the master's degree in asset management. Take it away, Toby. Thanks, Emily. <clears throat> so hi, everyone. I'm Toby Moskowitz. Um, I've uh, been a professor here since uh, 2015 uh, when I visited, actually 2016 when I officially took the offer. Um, that was, uh, so I've been here the last six years. Um, but prior to that, I was at the University of Chicago for 17 years, where I held the Fama Family Professorship in Finance, and hopefully you know the name uh, Eugene Fama. If not, and you come here, you will definitely know about him uh, from my class uh, and many of the classes. Uh, so the Nobel Laureate in 2013, who people often think of as the father of finance. And I mention him because part of the this program, of course, is going to have a heavy academic component, which is going back and looking at the hardcore academic principles uh, for what drive asset management. But the other half of this program comes from um, my co-founder of this program, um, who recently passed, uh, sadly, last year, David Swenson, who was the longtime uh, chief investment officer uh, of the Yale Investments Office and, and famous for pioneering the Yale model and really revolutionizing the way asset management was done, especially in the endowment space. And so David's contribution to the curriculum here, and I'll talk about the origins of this program, is really from the application uh, of all that academic theory. And by the way, many people didn't know this, but, but David himself had a PhD in economics from Yale uh, and took that academic rigor and applied it to you know, perhaps one of the most successful investment careers um, in, in history, rivaling that of you know, Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, and all those famous uh, famous investors, but in the in the endowment space. Um, so I come with you know twenty uh, what is it now twenty three years of academic experience teaching finance. Um, the genesis of this program um, really started uh, decades. You know, I would say when I was at the University of Chicago, I tried for you know about a decade to to start an asset management program like this, where I wanted to have you know, there were all these, uh, and I'll talk about this in a second. There were all these master's programs in finance cropping up. A lot of them were financial engineering programs, but I didn't feel that that was a very useful uh, program for getting into the asset management business. It focused too much on, on financial engineering, which to be honest, um, has that was popular in the 80s and, and the early 90s has now come way, way down in terms of, of importance. I wanted something that was much more geared in data science, in uh, academic economics, and in the theory of investments and, and asset management. But I needed, I wanted something that was practical too. So I knew how to teach the theory side and the, and the sort of uh, PhD level uh, type stuff, but I wanted to bring in people that um, did this for, for a living. And when I came to Yale, um, I had a, uh, what my, my dean actually arranged a lunch for me to meet David Swenson. Uh, Yale was trying to get me to leave the University of Chicago. Um, and part of my, um, you know, part of my reason for leaving Chicago was obviously Yale's an incredibly attractive institution and, and I really love being here, but also I work uh, part time with AQR Capital, which, you know, has uh, been something that has been very good for for um, for my career and my growth in the sense that I learn a lot from AQR about problems that academics should be solving. And then hopefully I contribute something to AQR about problems that we're dealing with in academia that could be useful in practice. But I uh, had having this lunch with David about five years ago, um, I mentioned to him, he asked me, you know, what I was teaching and what my goals were at Yale. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to start this master's program in asset management. And he just, you know, immediately said, oh my God, I've been saying that for years, that people aren't trained well enough in asset management. We hire the best and brightest from Yale. Uh, David talking about the Yale Investments Office. He said, we hire the best and brightest at Yale and we have to tell, train them 
um, for one to two years because you know they're really smart and bright, but but they're never trained in asset management. We have to do it ourselves internally. And then I had said, well, the same thing happens to be true at AQR and, and all these other places. That's why I wanted to start a program like this. And David graciously said, I'm in. Do you want me to help you with this? We could do this together. And I said, are you kidding me? This would be amazing. And so David and I spent the next four years designing the curriculum, um, bringing in faculty, not just from academia, but also um, from practice. Uh, and so a number of the professors, a number of the people that will be teaching in this program will be uh, investors that the Yale Endowment Office has worked with for many, many years, some of the top investors in the world who apply this. I bring in some of my AQR colleagues who have been applying the science of asset management for more than two decades um, to, fit, you know, to all kinds of different asset classes. And so I think what's unique about this, this program is there's nothing else like it in the world. It's a combination of academia and practice where some of the courses that we have just don't exist anywhere else. Because I have access to, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we have a course on distressed credit. No academic knows how to teach that stuff. The data is impossible to get because that data doesn't exist unless you're in the business. But we have one of the top uh, distressed credit managers in the world teaching a class on this. There are secrets for, for how they do this. And this has been one of, you know, Yale's longtime uh, investors who graciously has has agreed to teach the course. And we have we have you know half a dozen courses like this uh, of people who've been doing this for a living for decades and doing it you know as well as anybody in the world coming to Yale and teaching those courses. In addition to that, as Emily mentioned, you'll get a heavy dose of academic theory and asset management. Uh, you'll be sharing um, some courses with PhD students and and being put through the rigor of first principles of investment analysis. I'm teaching it right now. I'm teaching my quant investing course and teaching the basic building blocks of quantitative investing. But to be sure, I know one of the questions that's come up is this program is not just a quantitative program. Um, you know, we want, uh, we're going to have uh, a number of courses that are devoted to fundamental um, discretionary analysis as well as quantitative investing. Students are going to come here and learn both, and then they can specialize into whichever direction they want to go. And that's the beauty of bringing in a diverse set of managers that Yale works with, that I know in, in um, you know, my working with, with uh, practice, um, and they're all gonna come here and, and teach what they do. So our motivation though, is to fill this void that's existing in the asset management world. Um, you know, most places, they hire their own and then they have to train them for one to two years. You get trained in some of the basics of asset management, but a lot of idiosyncratic stuff that's specific to the firm. And quite honestly, a lot of these firms don't have the right people to train um, the future generation of asset managers in the right way. And one of the big motivations for both David and I was to develop a curriculum that taught the next generation of asset managers to do this right. And what I mean by right is something that's very important to us and consistent with the mission of the school is to be able to obviously apply the rigor and uh, that we need in asset management, but to do it the right way, to be a fiduciary, be responsible to your clients. David used to have this saying, which is what's great about this business is you can do good and do well at the same time. It's a wonderful career where you can make a ton of money and you can make a ton of money by doing the right thing, by putting your clients in the best position to succeed by partnering with your clients and not viewing them as adversaries or someone that you're just trying to make money off of. And once you have that incentive in mind and that goal, this can be an extremely rewarding business on both a financial and a personal level. And so one of the things that you're gonna see throughout the curriculum here is a devotion to that. We have a number of courses that Arwen will talk about more specifically that are truly unique that, that, that give you that flavor. For example, we have a course from the Yale Law School, the famous Yale Law School, that's going to talk about financial uh, responsibility, including things like financial fraud and other things that people get themselves into. This is taught by John Macy, a famous law professor. He brings in convicted felons who were caught uh, doing all these bad things. And the stories, it's a, it's a great cautionary set of tales to show you that you know you don't need to go down that path and there's lot that you can have a wonderful career doing the, the right thing. Uh, and that's gonna come up not just in terms of something as extreme as fraud, but even thinking about other things like how to invest um, 
in things that that further a different goal besides just you know financial returns things like environmental and social and governance investing esg investing as well as a, a myriad of other um objectives that your clients uh may be interested in and again that partnership is, is what we want here so um this this curriculum was developed in close collaboration with david and you're going to see elements of that throughout um and so although he's no longer with us um, we're hoping this program is going to carry on his legacy and what he stood for for 35 years running the Yale in, uh, Investments Office. Now, who is this program for? Well, we envision it for, just like I described, early career individuals. You can come into this program with no work experience directly from undergraduate and just interested in asset management. You can also come into this having worked for a couple of years, um, but early career individuals, what we want to do is really foster the next generation of asset managers with the right set of skills and ideas for how to create uh, a future in this business. Okay, so it's a one year program. It's intense. I won't I won't lie to you, but in nine months, you're going to have a degree from Yale. And that's what we really want to do is sub is basically substitute for the you know one to two year training programs that exist at all these other firms that quite frankly they i don't think a lot of them do it the right way they don't do it as uh intensely as we will and you don't get a degree from yale at the end of it and what this will do and i've talked to some of my colleagues at aqr and bridgewater and citadel and others is you go through this program for a year and on day one on your job you can be plugged in and productive and do something and I can tell you from my experience, that's typically not the case. We hire extremely smart, energetic individuals, but on day one, they're like, what do I do? <laughs> uh, tell me tell me what to do. And that's the way the industry has gone. And we, we think we can you know, have some serious impact on that. Now, what are we looking for? You don't have to be a quant uh, to be in this program, but you do have to have quantitative and analytical skills. Like I said, for the student that's interested in more the discretionary let's say private equity route or even discretionary uh, stock picking route or other asset classes um, that's going to do more fundamental analysis, you get that training here, but you still have to have a strong analytical background. Um, even if you're analyzing one company as opposed to 10,000 companies at once, you're still applying the same analytical rigor and economic um, discipline that we want throughout the courses. So you'll see some common themes throughout the courses, regardless of what the topic is, that are gonna show up over and over again. But that's who we're looking for, people who are interested in being engaged, in being thoughtful, analytical, uh, and wanting, having a passion for uh, asset management. <clears throat> so I mentioned this a little bit uh, already, but let me just emphasize this, which is this program is unlike anything else in the world. Um, it's a focus on theory and the practice of asset management. There's no other program out there that I'm aware of that has the depth and level of practitioners participating in our curriculum. We have uh, some of the top principals at AQR, Bridgewater, Cyrus Capital, um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a few, a few others, um, all teaching in our curriculum. And these are some of the top money managers in the world. We also have a colloquium that Arwen and I run, um, which is really David's idea of bringing in some of the very top um, asset managers and endowment uh, CIOs uh, and investors from all over the world to come and talk to our students in an intimate setting. Our, last week, we had Dean Takahashi, David's longtime number two at the Yale Investments Office, who talked to our students for two hours uh, and grilled them about some of the some of the. Uh, the Yale model and the Yale endowment, and it was just it was just a great experience. We have Paula Valent, who runs uh, Rockefeller uh, University's endowment, coming in another month, and then Cliff Asnes, the co-founder and managing principal of AQR, coming in December. And we're going to have big names like this coming about once a month to talk about not just their careers, but some of the latest you know lessons and and ideas that they're dealing with in terms of the uh, asset management wor world. So uh, I would say relative to other programs that are out there, you won't find another slate of courses that looks the same. We've got courses, as I mentioned, uh, John Macy's course in the law school is unlike anything else that exists. We've got courses on ESG investing, uh, behavioral finance and quantitative investing. You may find some of those in other programs, but the, the sheer state of the art focus on what's in asset management right now is unlike anything else with that mix 
of practitioner uh, and academia meeting in the middle. In fact, a lot of our courses will be jointly taught um, or, can, or can be jointly taught by both an academic and a practitioner where you're gonna see a blending uh, of these two worlds and how it's applied, okay? There is also an option for a joint MBA uh, and MMS degree and a number of our students are taking us up on that option. Um, and that gives you both a general management uh, degree to manage people, as well as an in-depth um, focus on the asset management program. But I just want to be clear here, this is a very different program than your typical financial engineering program. This isn't solving a bunch of different uh, equations to design new securities in financial engineering. To be honest, that's passe. This is about data science. It's about knowledge in economics and applying it to asset management. And it's got this very strong practical side that teaches you how to actually do this stuff. And like I said, I don't think anything even close to this exists anywhere else, okay? So like I said, it's a program that substitutes for an investment boot camp at most firms. Um, plus you get a degree from Yale. Um, and again, the training is gonna include both the ethical and the fiduciary side. And I can't stress that enough. When I look at all the firms that I know well that have been wildly successful in this business, they all have the same attribute which and not just firms, but endowments, foundations, and everything else, which is they partner with their clients. They view their clients as, hey, we're in this together. When you make money, we make money. And when you don't make money, we don't either. And that's the way we've operated at AQR. It's the way uh, many of the best firms that I know of have operated. And that can be an extremely rewarding uh, career. And so the opportunity here is to, to learn this the right way and to do this the right way. And that's really what we want to achieve with this program. So I'm going to turn it over to Arwen now, who's going to talk uh, more specifically about the curriculum to give you a flavor of, of what uh, David and I put together. And, you know, this is evolving too, but this is what we have currently. And Arwen, uh, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Arwen Zeisler. I'm the day-to-day uh, -day director of the program. So as you, you know, gathered from Toby's description of the program, uh, Toby has a day job, actually has two day jobs as a professor and at AQR. Uh, and so my role is basically to help Toby run the program on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and as Toby just mentioned, uh, you know, he and David put together a curriculum and, and uh, we've been actually already in the first year of the program, the curriculum has evolved somewhat, but there's four major elements. There's required lecture courses, elective lecture courses, the asset management colloquium that Toby spoke about uh, just a couple minutes ago, and a practical experience requirement. Uh, so in terms of the required lecture courses, we have nine half semester courses, uh, and you could see them listed there. So we have courses on asset pricing theory and behavioral finance, kind of metrics, investment analysis, quantitative investing. And the, the thing that unifies these is most of these required lecture courses take place in the fall semester, and they're mostly taught by uh, Yale finance faculty. So the basic idea of the curriculum is that in the fall, uh, you're taking almost all of the same classes together with one another. And the fall is really where you get the, the basic toolbox uh, to analyze and understand investments. And then the focus changes in the spring. So in the spring, you'll be taking predominantly uh, elective lecture courses. And the electives that are there, so you see you'll be taking seven half semester classes. And we actually have uh, 10 electives that were created especially specifically for the asset management program. And you'll see those listed there. And as I mentioned, the electives take place predominantly in the spring. And those are mostly taught by practitioners, uh, leading investment practitioners who are doing uh, the, the topics you see there, ESG investing and fixed income and hedge funds and so on. That's what they're specializing in is their day job. And then in the, the late afternoon or their evening, they're going to come to SOM and share their expertise with you. Uh, so that's, again, sort of the focus, you know, the, the fall, again, will be primarily required courses taught by the finance faculty, the common toolbox that all of you need. And then the spring is where you can heavily customize through the electives. And in addition, you know, I mentioned you have to do seven half semester classes and that are electives and that we've created 10 for the program. But of course, there's so many more facets to asset management than just the, the examples that are listed here on the slide. 
And so we also will let you take uh, a certain set of MBA electives or even uh, other classes across Yale University uh, with permission. We ask that you uh, get permission I have a little bit of a quality control element, but for example, we have many students who might be interested in taking a computer science course or an economics course or a math course or a statistics course. And rather than us having to essentially duplicate all of that expertise in house, when Yale has such a world renowned faculty in so many areas, you can go outside of the asset management program either to within the MBA community or to within the broader Yale community to really further customize the, the courses that you wanna take based on your own career goals and, and uh, aspirations. Uh, and then Toby already briefly spoke about the asset management colloquium. So that meets for the entire year. Uh, and as Toby mentioned, we're planning on bringing in leading asset management practitioners uh, about one a month or so to speak to students and this class is specifically for asset management students. So it really is a chance to, to meet and to engage with some of these leading investors on a small scale. And then the last major area of the curriculum, uh, as, you know, as Toby said, our aim is for you to learn both the theory and the practice of asset management. And to support that second goal, we have a practical experience requirement so after the, the fall semester is over, uh, most students will fulfill this requirement by uh, uh, completing a typical internship. And for the, the purposes of fulfilling the requirement, the internship needs to be at least 40 hours in length. Although many of you may wanna do a longer internship uh, just to get additional exposure to the investment world. Uh, so the, the internship is the most common way, but we also have a number of students uh, who have an interest perhaps in going on to a PhD program. And so those students might fulfill the practical experience requirement by working with one of the finance professors on an asset management research project. And then there's a, a couple other ways that students can, can ultimately fulfill the requirement. And the, the idea, again, this would be uh, an internship or a research assignment that you would start after fall semester. So it could be uh, between our fall and spring semesters, or it could be during the spring semester. And the, the requirement itself is structured as a class and a, an actual course with a number and a syllabus and all of that. And the reason for that is by structuring it as a course that meets certain requirements, uh, at this time, our Office of International Students and Scholars will approve international students do curricular practical training, uh, to obtain curricular practical training to complete the requirement, which in effect means that international students would be able to do an internship in the United States, which I know is something that's of, of great interest to, to many of you on the call. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of different uh, sort of key elements, important elements, uh, the sort of multifaceted curriculum that we've brought together for you. Uh, Toby also briefly mentioned earlier the joint degree option, and I want to just talk about that for a couple more minutes. So this is one of the uh, unique offerings that we have, and it's the ability to combine a Master of Business Administration, the traditional MBA degree, with the MMS in Asset Management. And the beautiful thing is you can do the dual degree or the joint degree option in the same amount of time as it would have otherwise taken you to do just the MBA. Uh, so administratively student or candidates do apply to each program individually and you would have to be accepted to both programs. Uh, we have the Silver Scholars MBA. So as Emily mentioned about five, five to 10% of MBA students actually do come directly from undergraduate studies, and they're admitted to what's known as our Silver Scholars MBA. And if you were to do the, uh, the Silver Scholars version of the joint degree, in the first year, you would complete the MBA core curriculum along with all of the other MBA students. Then in the second year, you would go off and you would essentially complete a one-year extended internship. So that would help you gain some of the work experience that you would not have had if you came directly from undergraduate. 
And then in the third year, so in the third year, you would then return back to SOM and you would basically use your MBA electives to meet the requirements of the MMS program in asset management. So after three years, you would have two degrees then. So not just the MBA, but the MBA and the MMS in asset management. For those of you who are considering applying to the program, if you have uh, several years of work experience, you might then be admitted directly into the regular MBA program, uh, which you heard Emily say earlier that our uh, MBA students average about five years of work experience. So if you're uh, in that range, three to seven years, something like that, you might be admitted directly into the MBA program. And then again, your first year would be completing the required MBA core. And then the second year you'd use, in effect, uh, rather than taking your MBA electives and spreading them across a wide range of studies, you would focus the second year electives to meet the uh, asset management requirements. So it's a, great, it's a great option, particularly because as I say, you have the ability to earn both degrees in the same time frame as it would take you to earn just an MBA. Uh, and some of the elements here, I think that have come up already earlier in the presentation, if, you, you know, if you're joining the asset management program, you're not just siloed in the asset management program, you're really joining the broader uh, School of Management community and really also the broader Yale University community. So you'll have certainly interaction with MBA students. Uh, many of the asset management classes are also open for MBA students to take as electives. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the reverse of that is also true. Many MBA electives are open for asset management students to take. So you certainly will encounter MBAs uh, in your day-to-day -day travels throughout Evans Hall. Uh, we have a executive MBA program, as Emily mentioned at the beginning, and this would be for uh, practitioners who have uh, a great deal more experience, often in the range of 10 to 15 years, but our EMBA program has an asset management track. So that would be a way to engage with the people who might soon be leading top and uh, asset management firms in the next few years. Uh, and some of your courses will overlap with the PhD program in finance. So you'll naturally meet those students as well. Uh, and as I mentioned to you earlier, you can take electives from across Yale <clears throat> with the approval of uh, Toby, our faculty director. And an important element is the ongoing help and support from the SOM Career Development Office. In, I know a number of you submitted questions before the start of today's session. And one of the questions that it was asked today, but I know that Emily and I have had many times at other Q&A sessions is how do we, <clears throat> You know, how do we find an internship and a job in such a short program? And really the, the key answer to that is that, so your classes are within nine months, but our career development office actually starts working with you before classes ever start. Our career development office begins working with you during the summer months in June and July. And that way you're already prepared and ready to go. And many of the career events start very early in the school year. There's a large asset management career fair that takes place in about a week and a half. And we're able to move all those career activities very early into the year because our career development office starts working with you so soon. Uh, other synergies and resources, uh, just the, it's a wonderful community and just the ability to interact with the faculty and with the practitioners. So we have the International Center for Finance, which is somewhat of a hub for finance research here at Yale. Uh, so you certainly will be interacting. In fact, someone from the International Center for Finance just reached out to me a couple days ago to start the interaction between our current asset management students uh, and the Center for Finance. And of course, the, the Yale Investments Office. So you heard Toby talk at length about how he and David Swenson uh, worked together for many years to, uh, to develop the curriculum in the first place. Our first asset management colloquium was just this past Friday, and our very first speaker was Dean Takahashi, who worked uh, side by side with David for 30 years. And Dean will be teaching an endowment management course in the spring semester. 
So, so Dean isn't uh, part of the investments office anymore. He's gone on to the Yale Carbon Containment Lab, but he still maintains active connections. And then in the spring, we have a, uh, we're gonna have a law course, a regulations course that's taught by the Associate General Counsel of the Investment Office. So there certainly are connections between the two. Uh, in terms of outcomes, so we really view, and some of this we've touched on earlier, we really view this as a way for you to achieve your career goals much faster than would otherwise be the case. Again, the idea of this program in lieu of what might be a several year training program uh, at an investment firm. Uh, certainly we have a global student body and likewise our career development office is targeting and will help you in your search for global career opportunities. And the, the opportunities that are available, uh, you know, we can think about them geographically as being all over the, the globe, but they also span the full spectrum of asset management. And again, this is one of the common questions that uh, Emily and I often receive is, are we targeting, uh, is the program designed, if it was developed by Toby and by David Swenson, is it just for someone who wants to be the next David Swenson, or is it just for someone who wants to be the next Toby Moskowitz? Uh, and we would argue it's actually much broader even than that. Uh, it really covers the entire spectrum. So there are some students who want to be the next Warren Buffett and you know pick up a 200 page 10K and read every detail. And we have other students who are interested in high frequency trading strategies or developing a FinTech. Uh, and certainly students who do want to become the next David or the next Toby. Uh, so really the, the career outcomes span the entire spectrum of asset management. And beyond the, uh, the sort of practicing side, we also think of the program as a springboard to a PhD in finance. So we have a number of students this year who are strongly considering a PhD program. And one of the ways that our program could be a springboard as I mentioned, two of the <clears throat> uh, two of the required courses are actually PhD courses with PhDs in the students, uh, 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 students in the class, and so that gives a way for students to uh, experience what PhD studies would be like. And of course, as I mentioned, one of the ways that you can fulfill the practical experience requirement is by helping a professor with their research. Uh, so hopefully, that gives you you know much better sense of. The, the type of students we're targeting and the type of outcomes that you could hopefully achieve at the end. And I believe at this point, Emily, I'm turning it back over to you. And Emily's going to tell you now a little bit. Uh, I'm sure all of you have questions about uh, that the group of students who started about a week and a half, two weeks ago. So Emily will tell you a little bit about that and a little bit more about the application process. So thank you, Emily. Oh, thanks, Arwen. Um, so I am excited to share. Um, a little bit of information about our current inaugural class of 2022 for the asset management program. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, we did welcome that inaugural class just last month. I got to sit in on that colloquium, the, the very first ever asset management colloquium on Friday. Arwen and Toby had invited me to come in and it was so exciting to see and to be a part of the first ever. Um, and it was really a riveting talk given by uh, Dean Takahashi. Um, so this year's class is comprised of 56 students, 45% being women, 77% being international passport holders. And this group represents 13 countries of citizenship, including Canada, China, Germany, Greece, India, Singapore, Switzerland, Taiwan, and Ukraine. And 89% of the class speaks at least two languages, and many are trilingual. And students in the class of 2022 enjoy a variety of interests and hobbies, which just kind of further enriches um, the Yale SOM community, um, just kind of through osmosis, I would say. Um, so interests and hobbies include volunteering, ballroom and Latin dance, travel, Chinese painting and calligraphy, uh, taekwondo, rugby, ballet, table tennis, and soccer. So they're a very fun bunch, as well as a very smart group. Um, and so we're incredibly proud and honored um, to host this inaugural class already. And we're really looking forward to seeing how they work together and individually, and how they leverage this experience for their future work. So that might leave you wondering, how can I get in on this action? <laughs> a 
<laughs> so essentially, before we open for q and I'd just like to offer a few words on that application process. So first, as Toby mentioned, we're looking for candidates who have a demonstrated interest in asset management um, or in this field, but we're really open to all majors here. So we're looking for candidates with strong quantitative skills, but again, we're not limited to certain majors or even courses. You may have studied engineering or chemistry, or maybe you've earned a liberal arts degree, um, but you maybe have some statistics classes or applied math um, with, within the courses that you may have taken. Uh, and we'll also be looking to standardize test scores to demonstrate quantitative preparedness, especially. Um, and so our target audience here is early career. Uh, relevant work experience and internships are certainly helpful, but not required. And on this slide, you'll see the components of the application, some of which you're familiar with from maybe applying to other schools. Uh, but I will know a couple of different things before I open for your questions. And so we do ask um, for two letters of recommendation, one of which we'd like to see from a professor or faculty member who can speak to your undergraduate performance or graduate performance. Um, and one would be a professional letter of recommendation, uh, perhaps from an internship experience or um, a full-time work experience. We do accept both GMAT and GRE, and we have no preference between those two types of assessments. And we do require a TOEFL or IELTS score for international students um, whose native language is not English and who did not earn a degree from an English speaking university. So one component of the application that's unique to Yale SOM are the video questions. Um, so there, there is a, a bit of an update coming there, um, which you will see in our upcoming e-news. So I would highly recommend um, signing on, um, introducing yourself um, to the Asset Management Admissions Committee. Um, so you can go ahead and visit our website to do that. And then you'll be up to date on all of the information relating to um, the different assessment types that we have, but video questions being one, um, but there will be a different assessment component um, being utilized there. But I do wanna say for this portion, um, it's not a substitute for the interview, but it does give us an opportunity to assess language skills for our international students and also to create a little bit more of a three-dimensional view of each applicant. Um, so in this particular assessment, we understand you might feel a little bit nervous completing that exercise, but I hope that you know that we do want you to shine in that component of the application. And these questions aren't there to trick you. They're typical behavioral interview style questions, and you'll have time to prepare before answering each question. And we do have one application deadline, which is set for January 12th. And after the deadline, our admissions committee begins the review process, um, and we do issue invitations to interview. But an interview is actually not required for admission. Um, all candidates will be notified of their decision by April 7th. As I say, it is a very manual process, so we spend a lot of time thumbing through applications and, and reading line by line of transcripts. So it does take a bit of time and we really appreciate your patience. Um, that doesn't mean you need to be radio silent. You can certainly um, get in touch with us at any point if you have an update to offer, um, say you're still in your senior year of undergrad and you have a, an update to share about classes you're taking, we're happy to, to hear about any updates um, that might give us a, a better sense of your preparedness for this program. And in terms of scholarships, all applicants will be automatically considered for merit-based scholarship and no separate essay or application is required for that. And scholarship recipients are notified at the time that they're admitted. And so now I'd like to go ahead and open for your questions. I see some in the Q&A box. We had a lot of pre-submitted questions as well. Um, we're happy to answer those questions about the program, the place, the admissions process. And I do encourage you to keep your questions fairly general at this point so that we can make sure that they're relevant to multiple people in the audience. But if you have specific questions about your situation, feel free to connect with me after the presentation via email. And I'll just quickly go ahead and share. That is our um, email address. Um, so feel free to jot that down. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so you can see all of us and so that we can get into questions. Thanks so much.
All righty. So we have Emily? quite a few. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just going to say, since we're talking about uh, Q&A, when yeah. is the first Q&A session that we'll be holding? Oh, great point, Arwen. So um, actually, the first one already is full with a wait list. Oh, <laughs> um, sorry. Because, no, that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually have um, multiple of those coming up. We have another on October 14th, and that's that one's not full yet. So come on aboard. Um, what's great about those sessions is um, I'm on that call, and it's more of like a meeting. So we can you share your screen. It's a little bit more it's supposed to mock that in person um, sort of Q and A as if you were on campus with us. Arwen frequently joins those sessions, and now that we have current students, some have also raise their hand to join and share the student perspective and how classes are going so far. And um, that wasn't something we were able to share last year in building the inaugural class. So it's very exciting to be able to do that now. Um, but I hope that you can join. And like I said, go ahead, um, introduce yourself um, and fill out that form there. And you'll know all about all the upcoming events we have. We have lots um, and look, looking forward to meeting all of you through those. And so let's kick it off. Um, Let's see here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you, Arwen, what do you feel is a preferred quality and a good candidate for the program? Uh, so we really, we're looking for a broad range of qualities, certainly. Uh, that's part of the reason why the application process is as multifaceted as it is. But you heard Toby talk about the fact that at the end of the day, finance and asset management, they are quantitative fields. Uh, so you do need to have strong quantitative preparation. We, you know, we always get some questions and we saw some in the Q&A. Uh, someone might ask, well, what if my background is, I think we had a question from someone with a background studying computer science, someone else studying mechanical engineering, wanting to know are those particular fields acceptable? So it's important to understand you don't have to come into this program having studied finance as an undergrad. In fact, only a very, very small number of our students have studied uh, finance in particular. As some have studied finance, some have studied accounting, many have studied economics, but we also had students who studied math and computer science and engineering and physics and things like that. Uh, students will also wonder, well, what if they came, you know, they studied a, they had a non-quantitative background. Their undergraduate major was something that was non-quantitative. Well, it, it is a quantitative program. So it is important that you've built a lot of uh, quantitative experience and taken a lot of quantitative coursework. But it's important to understand you don't need to have developed that entire background by the time that you applied. Uh, so, you know, the application you see is in uh, mid-January basically of next year, but for those of you who are still in school, you would still be able to use the, uh, the, the spring semester of your senior year in order to take coursework. And for those of you who've graduated, uh, we've often encouraged students who've graduated to, students who've graduated but feel they wanna take a refresher in math or they need additional math to go and take classes at a nearby community college. Uh, but we really do look at, you know, beyond just the quantitative background, we want to know well, why do you want to study asset management? And so the, you know, the essay questions more or less revolve around, you know, what are your short-term reasons for doing this program and what are your long-term goals? What do you hope to accomplish by doing this program? Uh, so there's, you know, there certainly is the, the preparation, the academic preparation that you would need, uh, but it's also important to understand you know, your passion for the field. What, why do you want to do the degree? What do you hope to accomplish? How do you perhaps think about changing the field of asset management someday? So hopefully it gives you a little bit of a better sense of, of what we're looking for. It isn't just, it isn't just a one dimensional process. And, and let me just add to that, you know, if I think Emily mentioned this, if you're a liberal arts major and don't have, you know, I think the important thing is not that you necessarily have had all the quantitative background, but that you're capable of handling the quantitative background that you would get in this program. So if you're a liberal arts major, but can demonstrate to us that, yeah, look, if it, I want to do the math and, 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 the, and the quantitative uh, statistics that are required for this program and I can handle it, that's fine too. We're, you're you're going to come here so that we can teach you the right things. You don't have to come in knowing all those things. So I think the, you know, 
the, the broad spectrum of backgrounds um, is quite diverse, but you know, it does help in the application process to demonstrate to us that you have the ability to handle that, that, uh, that analytical and quantitative um, requirements that we all have for the course. Great, thanks so much. Um, and so I've gotten some questions. Um, first of all, I, I kind of want to clear the air. There's a number of questions about are three-year degrees acceptable? Um, because I know outside of the US, that's that's very common in Europe, especially India. Um, yes, you certainly can apply with a three-year bachelor's degree. It doesn't have to be a four-year, it just has to be a complete bachelor's degree um, to apply. And applications are not reviewed on a rolling basis. Um, you need to submit your application by January 12th. Uh, I believe it's 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, in order for us to begin our review process. So it's not a rolling basis. There's one deadline, one decision release. Um, and then I'll go ahead and throw you um, this question. Um, a lot of questions relating to um, what is the homework and time commitment outside of the classroom? Um, and so I think a lot of students hear that you're saying that's a rigorous program. Um, so tell us what, what you kind of foresee there. So you want me to start, Arwen? <laughs> Since I'm uh, sure, sure. Right now, um, you know, it's it's look, it's it's uh, we're cramming a lot in nine months. Um, it's it's intense. Uh, th there's good and bad news. For nine months, you're going to be, uh, you know, I won't sugarcoat it. You're going to be working your ass off, but you will in this business anyway if you want to be successful. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, the the upside is it's only nine months, and in nine months you will actually know something and can be productive on day one in your job in, in, a, in a field that is quite demanding. It does require uh, long hours, but those hours can be extremely rewarding. And if you have a passion for this, you're going to love it. So I think Arwen mentioned this, you know, the first semester in the fall when you arrive, it's intense. You're going to be taking quant investing from me, financial econometrics from Brian Kelly, asset pricing theory from Stefano Giglio, and then fundamental investment analysis from, from Michael Schwertzler. It's a lot. Um, you know, I can't give you a precise hour, but uh, you know, it's uh, four classes and we're, we're all demanding in terms of uh, homework. For example, in my, I can speak to my class at least. Um, I have you guys replicating academic papers every week with Python. You're doing them in groups, but these things take 10 hours or so outside of class. And the learning curve is steep. Um, you know, the first couple of weeks, you'll probably be spending more hours than that catching up on everything. But I promise you, at some point, that learning curve flattens out and you start realizing, wow, now I start to know how to do this stuff. Now I can do a lot more interesting things and I can do it faster, more efficiently. And that's what we want to have happen at the end of nine months to where you can go to an employer, be plugged in and be highly productive from day one. So yeah, there's a lot of work. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, um, but it's good work. I promise you it's not busy work and I promise you it's used uh, at all the top uh, asset management firms in the world. Great, thank you for that. And so um, just to piggyback on that, um, I, I know you had mentioned Python. Uh, what other kinds of technology or computer programming languages or, or other things that students should know or kind of be prepared to know um, when coming, um, if admitted? Yeah, I mean, Python is what's used nowadays, but um, as most of you know or have realized, languages change over time. I mean, I used to do everything in MATLAB. Now the world is Python. Five, 10 years from now, it'll be something else. Um, we're gonna put a heavy emphasis on Python, but any programming language you use can, can be useful. It's really more about the logic and, and the, the ability to apply it. But I would say Python, um, I would say if you if you have some training or could get some training in financial statement analysis, a lot of that's done in Excel, which is not hard to program, but more just the concepts of, of the building blocks of, of financial statement analysis. And again, you'll get that when you get here too, but if you wanted to get a leg up, uh, I would do that as well. Other things that people use, um, people still use MATLAB. Um, I don't think anyone uses Fortran anymore. That's what I, I grew up on. But uh, uh, you know, C I think is used uh, by 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 people as well. Um, but you know, uh, I would say uh, Python seems to be the the number one thing that's used, certainly on the quant side uh, of the business. For the non-quant side, it is more about financial modeling, which can be used in a lot of different applications. 
like I said, off in Excel and some other type of programming language is fine too. Um, but um, that's what I would say. Arwen, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, for those coming from the background of statistics and data science, you're probably familiar with R. So a lot of quantitative analysis can be done in R as well. Uh, and, you know, as Toby said, Excel for the financial modeling, Python and MATLAB for some of the, the hardcore uh, calculations. Uh, you know, I would say here, it sort of ties in with the, in some ways, with the, the question about the level of workload too. Sometimes students will ask, well, do you need to be a expert Python coder uh, on day one? And, it, you know, that's certainly not the case. You certainly will pick it up as you go along. But given the fact that there is, there is a lot of work and, and it's a steep learning curve those first few weeks and those first few months. It certainly helps if you're at least have some ground level familiarity with Excel and with Python before you get into the program. Um, and, and just if I may sort of veer off in a complete other direction for a moment there, I saw a question on is the program uh, STEM eligible? And so since that's a very quick one to answer, the answer is yes, we are a STEM eligible program. Uh, so for those international students, you would be eligible for the extended, uh, the, the two-year extension to the one-year regular OPT, so the three years of total uh, occupational practical training after graduation. And I am getting a handful of questions, gentlemen, about um, someone here works as a full-time director and asset management firm. Um, and some are asking, could this be beneficial for experienced professionals? I could see how even the most experienced um, asset management professional would be very interested to hear what you have to say, Toby, about um, any number of things. But um, we do say early career professionals. Um, but uh, that being said, um, the admissions committee kind of says, state your case, um, put together an application that's compelling, put together an application that says that you need this knowledge base and this information in order to make strides in your, in your future career prospects um, and kind of then leave it to us to, to make that decision. Um, so you're certainly not, um, we're not discouraging you from applying, um, but also just make sure that this program, after having heard Arwen talk about the curriculum, does this program make sense for you? Um, are you going to be learning something new to you? Uh, that, that would be my argument. I don't know if um, you, you gentlemen have any comment there. No, I, I think you said it perfectly. I think I agree. Sorry, Arwen, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. What, yeah, I was just going to say, when, when we say, when we refer to early career, uh, we're thinking of that as early in your asset management career. It, you know, so as an example, sometimes someone will come to us and they'll say, well, I've worked as an attorney for 10 years. And as an attorney, I've always been involved in working with asset management firms, helping them prepare contracts and other legal documents. But now I want to get into the, uh, the, you know, the, the front desk of the business. I want to be choosing investments and working with clients. But am I too far along in my legal career? So that would be an example of someone who, you know, the 10-year attorney, they have a lot of experience, but they're very early in their asset management career. They haven't yet worked as an asset manager. And that's where it would then be important, the, the essay questions, that part of the application to tell us, you know, about your background and why you want to make this transition. Um, for some who come in, depending on, you know, we do get interest sometimes from students who have worked at an asset management firm, in some cases for many years, might be 10 years at an asset management firm. Uh, and in that case, I would actually, you know, ask you to consider our executive MBA program that has an asset management track. Uh, so that's part of the reason, you know, the, the two programs sort of really fit together. If you want asset management, but you're you're early in your asset management career, then our program is for you. If you're somebody who has worked with an asset manager and accumulated a lot of experience, and now you're thinking about what's the next step to move into the leadership of my asset management firm, then you would wanna think about the executive MBA program, which like I say, has a focused asset management track itself. And so in that case, the, the executive program would be the one that fits closer to your overall 
Thanks so much. And so we're we're getting to 10. Um, if I could, um, I'm just going to phrase one last question to you both, um, and then we'll we'll say our goodbyes. Um, but I'm getting some questions around um, some individuals that are working at their current employer, and they're wondering if there's opportunities or resources available in the program to help with specific issues that they're grappling with in their professional realm. Um, also some that have said that they've started their own funds and you know, will, will they be able to, to learn um, some helpful tools there? So we have some entrepreneurs on deck as well. So how do you kind of see this program supporting those individuals specifically who maybe already have a foot in the door um, in, in the asset management world? Um, just yeah, so up. I would say um, the program can help a lot with both with both of those. We have a couple of students who are actually working while they're in the program, um, and they're hoping to take some of the skills that they're learning currently and apply that to their daily jobs. Uh, that's not only uh, it's encouraged. <laughs> it's something that we that we love, and we hope they're they're picking some of those skills up. I also know of a couple of students who want to run their own asset management firm and are taking some entrepreneurial courses that we offer here. This speaks to something Arwin mentioned, which is you can take other courses at SOM and on campus. And a few of the students are doing that precisely because they want to run their own family business or are already part of a family business they're going to run or start their own business on their own. Um, so I think, you know, when you think this comes back to something I want to mention earlier, which is the set of careers that come out of this program can be wide ranging. Um, there might be, Arwen mentioned this, it might be the next David Swenson running, uh, you know, one of the world's largest endowments. You could be Warren Buffett. You could end up going into, you know, uh, a regulatory environment um, uh, where you're, you're regulating uh, securities and, and funds. You could start your own family business. You could end up in the advisor business. You could end up in the consulting business, even investment banks. The range of skills that um, you can get from this program and, and tailor, especially the electives, to something that you're interested in uh, is very wide ranging. So we welcome uh, any and all. And I think I'll echo one other thing that Emily mentioned, which is in your application, state your case. State your case, why you want this program in asset management and what you want to do with it and what you hope to do with it. Um, and we read them and, and, and you know, make, make, make the case. Um, so we want a diverse set of uh, students with interests. Great, thank you so much. I was feverishly responding to others in the Q&A box um, as, we, as we were running out of time. Um, and so I'll kind of leave it there. I think that's, that's kind of a, a great point to land on. Thank you so much, Toby and Arwen, for joining us. And thank you all for tuning in. Of course, we will provide a recording of this session um, for you to refer back to at a later date. Um, and we do hope to see your application. We really look forward to um, having many talented individuals apply and hopefully many join for our next class. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Goodbye and good luck. Thanks so much.